back to Hot Slashes and Cold Topics. Today, we are very excited to have Dr. Daniel Levitin on. He is a neuroscientist, a cognitive psychologist, and he is also a best-selling author. And today, we're going to talk about his book, Successful Aging, A Neuroscientist Explores the Power and Potential of Our Lives. So thank you for coming, Dr. Levitin. Well, thank you for having me. As a man who is experiencing andropause, yes. I, <laughs> I, am, I am interested in having this conversation. We felt that when I saw your book and I saw the title of your book, I immediately thought, oh my goodness, I have to read this. And I think even before I finished the book, I was already contacting uh, your person to interview you. I went to your website and found you and thought, we really got to interview you. So thank you so much for coming. And, you know, we can just jump right in. Why write this book? Why now? What prompted it? Oh, thank you, Colleen. Um, you know, the, neuro the neuroscience community has learned a lot about how the brain changes as we age. And really, we start aging when we're born. Uh, if we're lucky, we, we don't stop aging uh, because the alternative is, you know, <laughs> so uh, um, the... Uh, the neuroscience of hormones and hormone balance and neurochemistry has really come a long way. And unfortunately, that information hasn't really trickled down to the average reader. And um, I, so, yeah, that's why I wrote the book. I, I see it as part of the job of scientists, all scientists, to communicate our findings to the public because science exists as a public trust. Uh, and in your book... Um uh, the biggest thing that stuck out to me was your lifespan, then the health span versus the disease span. So can you talk a little bit about that? Isn't that interesting? So this is mm -hmm. a concept that came from uh, Elizabeth Blackburn at the Salk Institute. And the idea is so simple. Um, your lifespan, well, you know what that is. It's, it's how much time you have on the planet from when you're born to when you die. But she divides it up into the health span and the disease span. So for most of us, you more or less go sailing along healthy. Uh, you might break your leg or get a cold or get mono or whatever. But I mean, most of us, your life is characterized by this long stretch of healthiness, healthfulness. Uh, and then towards the end, you get sick and you die from what you got sick from. And, you know, unless you get, you know, hit by a car or something. So I'm talking about most of us. Um, it's interesting to think of life that way, health span, disease span. We may not be able to do much to change your actual time on the planet, but there are steps we can take starting today, all of us, that can push out the proportion of that lifespan that'll be healthy versus disease-ridden. Mm -hmm. We want to minimize the disease span. Right. It's like a quality of life um, versus quantity. It would be nice to have both, you know, <laughs> a lot of quality during that quantity. Yeah. Well, it's, it's an interesting point, Bridget, because I think the average person, everybody differs along this dimension. Uh, my father wants to, as an example, my father was 88. He wants to live as long as possible. He does not care about quality of life. As he says, oh. <laughs> he's sitting in a corner somewhere drooling on himself and unaware of his surroundings at 110. That's fine with him. <laughs> my mother is very much interested in quality of life and I think would be willing to sacrifice a few years of um, being out of it to have a few mm -hmm. more years of being with it. Yeah, huh, that is interesting. I guess it's an individual, how they feel. Um, you know, I guess if that's what it is about it. But it's interesting you said that about your father because that led to another uh, thing I wanted to talk about. Um, in your book, you talk a lot about, you talk, I believe, about your grandfather, and correct me if I'm wrong, and your father, and how people are squeezed out as they get older from their jobs. Uh, but you also talk about the, the importance of having that experience. So can you share the importance of that with our listeners? In the last few years as a society, we've taken on many issues that had not been talked about and were long overdue, all the isms, uh, racism, sexism, the glass ceiling, um, 
uh, homophobia. Um, we've increased the conversation about LGBTQ rights. And of course, we have a long way to go there. But the, uh, the one ism we haven't really addressed as a society is ageism. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a colleague in England who's being pushed out of his job. He's at the peak of his career at Cambridge University. You're not allowed to work at Cambridge past age 67, no matter how good you are. Wow. I was really? hiring for a, uh, on a hiring committee for a scientific institute in Germany. And the most qualified people with all the experience and so much to offer were 65. Well, Germany has mandatory retirement at 67, and they weren't about to offer a job with a $2 million uh, startup cost uh, to somebody who was only going to work two years. It's, it requires a political change, a societal change, and just the conversation the three of us are having right now and it rests on um, a kind of societal narrative that's false, which is that old people are doddering and incapable. In your book, you gave an example of someone who was setting up a sound system uh, because you're a musician, and they were setting up the sound system in your home and just how they just had done it so much. I mean, you can just share briefly because we have a lot to ask you, but if you should just share briefly a little bit about that story. Yeah, well, this was extraordinary. What came out of it was my thinking about radiologists. My grandfather was a radiologist, and he was pushed out at age 62 uh, by his partners. Um, and radiology, like so many things, requires experience and pattern matching. You're, you're looking at blobs on a piece of film and trying to figure out whether they're cancer or not or osteoporosis. It's tricky. Computers aren't so good at it, and young radiologists are not good at it because they, they may have seen a lot of slides, but they haven't lived long enough to see the clinical outcomes of their bad calls. Uh, and so I was thinking, you know, if, if, you, if you ever need a radiologist, you're far better off with a 75-year-old than a 35-year-old because their, their pattern matching is better. Mm -hmm. And around that time, I wanted to, uh, I'd moved into a new house and my wife generously allowed me to take an extra bedroom and turn it into my home studio. And um, I realized I needed to tune the room, as they say. I needed an acoustic expert to come in and do the fine tuning. And the best guy in the area, in Hollywood, was 86 years old, George Ausberger, and he had just done this for a friend of mine. And of course, the, the complexity here is that your hearing starts to go. There's no 86-year-old who can hear the high frequencies like a 50-year-old. A um, but my friend Michael Brook, the composer, said that George had done a fantastic job in his studio. So I hired the 86-year-old George. He came in and he had learned to work around his hearing loss, and the changes he made were extraordinary. I mean, I, I, I'm no stranger to acoustics. I've been doing my own acoustic spaces for 40 years, but, you know, this is an expert. And in the space of an hour and for $300, he made a huge difference Wow! Uh, in, in the quality. And he finally, at the very end, took out his measurement devices and realized he was off by half a decibel, which is an infinitesimal amount, right? You know, it, so um, there's no substitute for that experience. And it tells me that older adults who are unable to work and have so much to offer, especially during the pandemic, um, might seek opportunities to mentor, to tutor, to share what they know. And I know that people like my father saying, oh, well, I don't know anything. Nobody cares what I have to say. Uh, but he was an accountant for 50 years. There are a lot of young accountants who I think would love to know more about what a career looks like over that span of time. And it's interesting because it really brings the con concept of mentoring and the importance of intergenerational businesses where you do have that level of experience and then you have the newer generation who are open to learning that, but we have to change the narrative in society. You know, you give that great example of, of when people start to lose their memory and how we talk to ourselves. Oh, great, it's Alzheimer's, I'm doomed. Like, get the chair ready. 
Or someone who's in your college class will say, oh, I didn't get enough sleep last night. I can't find my keys. It's no big deal. It's, it's a lot of the narrative that we speak to ourselves and that society speaks to us. So how do you think that can, how do you think we can work on that ourselves to say, okay, successfully aging doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to lose your hearing, but it's okay because that doesn't mean you're going to be in a chair soon rocking the day away. Yeah, well, so from a neural standpoint, there are a number of compensatory mechanisms that kick kick in. So yeah, your eyesight uh, starts to go. Uh, It takes longer to remember things. It takes longer to do things. That's pretty much every decade after 40 that that starts. Mm -hmm. But the compensatory mechanism is experience, increased judgment, increased problem-solving ability that continues to increase through our 90s and beyond. And in terms of the narrative, Colleen, I think, um, you know, there's a few things. One of them is we're doing it. We're, we're having a conversation about this, and your listeners hopefully will find it thought-provoking. I, th- I think the second part is the arts. I think the arts have a responsibility to stop portraying older adults in a way that's just too easy comically. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, to marginalize them, I mean, the, the, it, it's too easy for a sitcom to, to have the, uh, the old person be the butt of the joke. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, what I like so much about the show Grace and Frankie with Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda, uh, I interviewed Jane for the book, by the way, uh, and Sam Waterston and... Um, uh, Martin Sheen that they're not making f- the old people the butt of the jokes in fact their kids are more often the butts of the joke right. um, the, these are people in their 80s who are represented with nuance and compassion and humor it's a, it's a funny show mm-hmm. um, and I think the third thing is that each at, at an individual level I mean you know, there, there's sort of the communications level, which is what we're doing. There's the uh, arts and inspiration level, which is what literature, theater, and television can do, and film, painting to some extent. Um, And then at an individual level, I think we need to make an effort, whatever age we are, to cross what what Colleen, you said, is the generational divide. we need to make an effort because as we've seen with, I mean, just to take LGBTQ as a really good example, um, if you know people who identify with that community and you know that they have experiences that are very much like yours, they're not all that different. Uh, LGBTQ is not who they are. It's just, uh, uh, you know, a, a part of their identity, but, you know, they still have their own interests and preferences and friendships, you know, not completely defined by that. We find the same thing about, you know, older adults. You, you know, I, you don't have to be defined as a 90-year-old. When I interviewed Jane, in fact, she was reluctant to talk because she says, "Why? Well, I, I, I don't think of myself as an 80-year-old woman. I don't want to be talking as an 80-year-old. I want to talk as an actor and as a, 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 an activist. And, you know, the 80-year-old part is incidental. She said, you know, it might be salient to you, but it's not salient to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because That's she's amazing. a role model. It's kind of a role model to us, but that's just a tiny part. So completely get that part. Um, then also just other things in your book, so much in your book that was important. Um, you also talked about when you were talking about patterns, you were talking about an exercise and what really struck me was the hiking, how hiking is so important. Exercise is important. And you say that all exercise is, but can you talk about some of the, um, exercises that are really helpful for us as we age? Well, hiking is is an interesting case because too many of us, when we think of exercise, we think of the gym and, you know, a bicycle. Um, uh, George Schultz has been taking a spinning class at age 100. Yeah. Um, but really, most of us are too sedentary. 
across this country. And that sedentarism is the enemy of health, uh, not lack of exercise per se. So getting up and moving around is the big thing you can do for yourself. And especially walking on uneven natural surfaces, because with each step, your brain is having to make a lot of decisions about the pressure that you put on your foot and um, your gait and you slow down and you speed up, there are hazards. Um, it's, that's neuroprotective. It's very helpful to walk in nature. Now, if you can't, walking along the street is, is, is good too, just not as good. And don't let the good be the enemy, or don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Mm -hmm. Do what's good and do what's perfect. Right, right. Um, also, uh, there's so much. I've got my list here. <laughs> um, you also talk about the importance of sleep, which I hear so many people, especially as we age, have so much difficulty with sleep. So much insomnia is going on. I know right now my mother-in-law is 76, and she is all of a sudden um, experiencing these problems she tries to go to bed. She tries to follow those things. She's awake. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of sleep? Well, my wife and I are going through that because of uh, the hormonal changes associated mm -hmm. with our lives. And I devoted a whole chapter of the book to sleep and a, and a kind of extra chapter to how the whole internal clock works. The, the, the long and short of it is that it's a myth that older adults need less sleep than younger adults. Total myth. They still need their eight or nine hours or whatever, you know, is healthful for your body. Some adult, older adults need more uh, because they spend more time thinking than exercising. And the thinking is what requires the restoration, not the physical labor and, uh, and, and uh, movement. So Getting it can be difficult. There's some new literature that wasn't out yet when I wrote the book that vitamin C deficiency can lead to troubles sleeping and um, vitamin C deficiency can creep up on you. Your body can be less capable of metabolizing vitamin C. My mm -hmm. doctor has been recommending 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day, oh. um, which is not... Not an, an uncommon recommendation for other things, the immune system function, COVID, mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah. Um, it's not expensive. There are very few side effects. Um, but sleep hygiene is important. Um, mm -hmm. our the timekeeper in our brain becomes less able to keep track of things and secrete the right chemicals and hormones when it's supposed to. And really the single best thing you can do for yourself is to go to bed at the same time every night, get up at the same time every morning. That said, you know, my wife and I, we sleep in a darkened room. We have a fan on to cover up street noise. We have earplugs. Uh, we have a mattress that, you know, if one person moves, it doesn't <laughs> knock the other person out of the bed. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, but even so... I went to bed at my usual time last night. An hour later, I was wide awake. And as a neuroscientist, I know that the worst thing I can do is stay in bed and fret. Mm -hmm. So I got up and I read. Mm -hmm. uh, and I puttered around a bit. And then I got tired and I went to sleep. And okay. I'm functioning on less sleep than I ought to. <laughs> but... Um, I woke up at the same time I always wake up, uh, which will help to train my body clock. In fact, I, 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 for my birthday this year, just a few weeks ago, my wife got me a Fitbit, mm -hmm. which uh, keeps track of my sleep. Probably not all that well. Yeah. Uh, like <laughs> GCAP like I would have in my lab. Yeah. But it helps me see relatively how well I'm doing. How are you doing with the Fitbit? Well, I, I like it. Uh, I, I like the reminders that it tells me to get up and move around. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like being able to see what it's telling me about my sleep. Again, it, it's not, it's more of a toy right. than a scientific instrument, but. You talk a lot about the relationship between personality and successful aging. With the individuals that you interviewed, is there a person, one or two personality traits that you saw that were more dominant in them, meaning like Jane Fonda and other people you interviewed? Was, you know, curiosity 
or resilience that you speak about in the book, were they dominant features in their personalities? Without exception, the people who I interviewed uh, and, and then or wrote about but didn't interview directly, like Betty White or um, uh, Carmen Herrera, great 100-year-old, 104-year-old painter, Julia Hurricane Hawkins, 104-year-old <laughs> uh, competitive runner. Uh, they're curious. They're uh, interested in trying new things, which is related to curiosity. Um, and overwhelmingly, I think the all of them keep moving. They 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 don't they don't retire. Or if they retire from something, they retire to something else. They stay engaged with productivity and with life. Jane Goodall said it best. Um, she's no longer actively doing much primatology field work, but she's got a punishing schedule. And she says, go, go, go. Don't stop. Judy Collins said almost identical words. Go, go, go. Don't stop. Keep moving. Keep working. Find new things to do. Um, it, it's... It sounds exhausting, but paradoxically, it's not. Mm -hmm. What's exhausting is have no is having no reason to get out of bed in the morning and having nothing to look mm -hmm. forward to. What's invigorating is to wake up, like Jane Fonda, or Jane Goodall, or Judy Collins, or mm -hmm. uh, you know any of these folks we're talking about. And to say, I, I can't wait to get, you know, continue this project I've started on, or even better, find some new interest. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That was a big message I got from your book was, you know, Judy, don't retire. Judy, yeah. yeah Judy, Judy took a bunch of her old songs and reworked them. Yeah. She did a tour with Stephen Stills, who she, whom she had never toured with before. And they had to, you know, create a new show when she was 78. It was extraordinary. Wow. Wow, that is that is really. Uh, It'll that be interesting. Yeah, oh, it'll ahead, be interesting Holly. to see how the this year of the pandemic affects the aging seniors that are now kind of entering that seventy five and up range who are high risk and weren't able to be outside and you know maybe walk around but not really interact with people. I wonder if how that's going to affect the success of aging. Well, John Fogarty, who uh, was the founder of Creedence Clearwater Revival, I don't know how old he is, 75-ish. Uh, since the lockdown, uh, he was never a particularly prominent social media presence, but he has his own YouTube channel now, and he's been making music with his kids, very high production quality videos, like little films, and distributing them for free on YouTube as a way to engage his audience and stay in the game. Um, younger than he, uh, Rodney Crowell, who is um, maybe 69 or so, and Roseanne Cash, who's my age, 63, they've been very active with making new music. Rodney sent me advances of a forthcoming album that I think is the best thing he's done in a 45-year career, and he's done it during the lockdown. Mm -hmm. And Roseanne yeah. has been you know, very active on um, trying new things on social media and, and doing performances. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, perspective. That, it, it is a lot. To, I think it has a lot to do with it. And then, because um, we don't have a lot of time, I want to talk, you, you talk about the importance of conscientiousness. Is that, would you say, the most important thing in successful aging? You, you took the words out of my mouth. Oh, okay. <laughs> It, it, the single most important factor of all the different ways that humans differ from one another is conscientiousness, which is really a cluster of traits and facets having to do with uh, being rule abiding and stick to and being dependable and reliable and doing what you say you'll do, being honest, um, being responsible. Uh, and so conscientious kids aren't going to cross against the light and so they're less likely to end up in the hospital yep. conscientious adults will follow at least minimal rules and not end up in prison which is bad for your health <laughs> and conscientious adults uh, tend to have a doctor and they see their doctor when they're sick and 
they, they, they do what the doctor tells them to do. Mm -hmm. uh, my doctor friends tell me 80% of their patients are what they call non-compliant. They don't take mm. the medications when they're supposed to. They don't do what they're supposed to. And certainly if you have a good doctor, that's good for your health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, conscientious people pay their bills on time. They don't right. end up being having their homes foreclosed. I mean, all these things are that all the major stresses of life, apart from the things you can't control, mm -hmm. uh, like right. whether you get mugged or not. Uh, right. But, right. You know, a conscientious person is going to be careful where they walk, but you still can't control everything. Right. Um, you know, the, with, with what's in your control, it makes a big difference. And the big news here uh, is that you can change if you're not conscientious enough. You can change right. at any age. Right. right. You're not doing that's, that, yeah. that's what I was kind of leading into. This, you know, a lot of people believe once you're at a certain age, you're set in your ways. And you make the argument that you're never set in your ways. You can always change and grow. It becomes more difficult to change as we get older um, because our brain no longer produces the same levels of chemicals that make us want to change and explore and try new things. But recognizing that, we have to push back against it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to not go quietly into that good night. We have to rage against it and decide, I'm going to try new things uh, and I'm going to try to change myself for the better. I really appreciate you coming. And I'm looking, I've been really conscious of time. So conscientious. I'm being conscientious. Yeah. See, she's being conscientious. <laughs> I am, I'm going to live forever. So but thank you so much. I just, um, I will tell the listeners about the book, Successful Aging. Uh, make sure you check that out. And you also have a website as well. Um, DanielLevitin.com. L-E-V-I-T-I-N. Successful Aging is now out in paperback, but the hardback's still available. They're about the same price now, uh, whichever you prefer. Paperback. And Audible. Carry. It's also yeah. an Audible. Oh, yeah, it's an Audible. Uh, I read the audiobook myself. Uh, mm -hmm. It's unabridged. And then um, I've been playing around with Instagram uh, since uh -huh. the pandemic because I, at 63, wanted to try something new. I haven't made my way to TikTok, but we haven't luck. either. <laughs> On Instagram, I'm Daniel Levitin official. Okay. Okay. I'm going to write right. that down. We'll okay. make sure the, all the links are, are also in the show notes so that people Lovely. can get in touch with you. Oh, it's such so a much. pleasure to meet both of you and oh, thank to, you. to share ideas with you. And, uh, you know, as you know, um, maybe your listeners don't, really the most neuroprotective thing you can do aside from movement and you know, walking in nature is to have a conversation with somebody you don't know. It uses up more of the brain and stimulates more areas of the brain than performing brain surgery or designing a rocket ship or being a concert pianist. This is what you're doing is the best thing you could be doing. Oh, well, thank oh, you. Wow, That's good thanks. to hear. <laughs> We'll be we forever. are going to live for yeah. exactly. Wet and, and then thank you. healthy. Thank you for inviting me to be part of it. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much for your time. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm.